So um, today I'm going to be talking, uh, so what I'm talking about now is going to be sort of a follow-up to the talk that Alan gave in the morning, or um, not necessarily a follow-up, but just sort of a different perspective on, on some of the same material. So everything I say today is, is going to be j uh, joint work with Theo johnson fried and Alan Weinstein. And just to give you an outline of, of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, so we're going to, we're looking at the linear symplectic category. And uh, the problem with the linear symplectic category um, is that, uh, well, as Alan mentioned, composition is not continuous. So composi composition of Lagrangian uh, correspondences there is not continuous. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So I'm going to explain what these two problems are. Um, and the second problem with the linear symplectic category is that quantization is not functorial. So I'll explain why both of these things happen. Um, so we're going to, then after that I'm going to introduce a replacement for the linear symplectic category, which I, um, I call the derived linear symplectic category. And I'm not using the term derived here in any pre precise sense. Um, it's just a sort of, to suggest that this is some sort of homotopical replacement or something like that. Um, and in this, in this replacement, composition is continuous and quantization is, is functorial. But we can, we can choose a, a functorial quantization scheme. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So first of all, what is the linear symplectic category? Um, so I'm going to denote it by LSIM, or as Alan denoted it this morning, by SL rel. So the objects are symplectic vector spaces. So those are pairs um, V, where V is a vector space, um, and V is always equipped with a two form. So it's an element of wedge two of V dual, uh, which we assume is non-degenerate. And just to be precise, what do I mean by that? Well, um, given this two form, I can cook up a map from V to D d V dual, which I call omega sub V flat. And how does this map work? Well, it takes an element of V and it maps it um, to V dual by plugging it in to the first component of omega V. And this non-degeneracy non condition is just that this map is an isomorphism. Okay, so those are the objects of the um, linear symplectic category. What are the morphisms? Well, um, there are Lagrangian correspondences. And I denote a Lagrangian correspondence as follows. So let's say L is a Lagrangian correspondence. So it goes between two um, symplectic vector spaces, and it's not a map in the, in the usual sense, it's not a map of vector spaces, so I'm going to draw it with an arrow with a little bar through it. Instead, it's a relation, so, um, so this, this L is going to be a subspace of the direct sum, okay, just to be consistent with what I've written in the notes, it's going to be a, direct, a subspace of the direct sum of the symplectic vector space W um, with a sym symplectic vector space V bar. And here, what is the, um, what is the two form on V bar? Well, we take the two form on V and we negate it. Okay. Okay, and secondly, this, this L is Lagrangian, so that means that L is equal to L perp. Okay. So this is the usual definition of a Lagrangian correspondence, but I'd like to propose a, a variant on this definition. So one and two, so conditions one and two are equivalent to the following diagram being a pullback square. So I take L and I have what I call a source map from L to V. So this is just the inclusion of L as a subspace here followed by the projection to V. And I also have a target map from L to W. So this is the inclusion of L as a subspace here, plus the projection, composed with the projection to W. Now down here I put the dual space to L. And uh, and I want a map from V to L dual. So what do I do? Well, first of all, I use this map from V to V dual, and then I compose with the dual of S. Okay, so that gives me a map from 
V to L dual. And similarly, I have a map from W to L dual. Okay? And conditions one and two are equivalent to this being a pullback square. Maybe. Okay. Uh, so I mean, it may, may take a moment to, to see why, but if I have any diagram of this form, then since L is a, a pullback, constructed as, as a pullback, um, with respect to, to V and w, and w along some other space, L is certainly a subset of the direct sum of V and W, right? It consists of pairs of elements in V and W um, such that they both map to the same element here. And what is, what is the kernel of the direct sum of these two maps? Well, it may take a moment to think about it, but the, the, the direct sum of these two maps, since, L, since, since these are the dual of that, are precisely, um, so something is in, Something is in the kernel of, of these, sorry, the direct sum of these two maps uh, gives you an identification with the object down here um, as the quotient space of W plus V modulo the annihilator, the symplectic annihilator of L. Okay, so something's in the kernel precisely if it's in the annihilator of L, so in this, uh, in this object here. So I think Alan called this L. Um, I guess it would be this morning. So it's the symplectic orthogonal to L. So, so the kernel of these maps is a symplectic orthogonal to, to L, and so, um, so this is a pullback square if and only if L is equal to its symplectic orthogonal. Okay. So any diagram of this form defines a Lagrangian correspondence from, from V to W. Okay. And how do we compose um, Lagrangian uh, correspondences? So composition is composition seen as setwise relations. So it's just the composition of setwise relations. So we forget about the, the fact that this is either subspace or Lagrangian, and we just view them as relations between V and W, and we just compose them as setwise relations. Okay, but um, if, for example, um, these, these two correspondences, so let's say I have two correspondences, if these compose transversely or are congenial in Allen's terminology, So I might, I might call this a, a transverse composition. So what do I mean by a transverse composition or a congenial composition? Well, if I take the direct sum of L and L prime, I get a map from that to V, right? It's just uh, the, the, on the L prime component, it's the uh, target map in this picture. And on L, it's the source map in this picture, the direct sum of those two maps. And these are said to compose congenially or transversely if this is a surjection. If these two maps, the direct sum of those two maps subjects onto V. Well, in that case, um, we have a really nice way of writing the composition. So if I want to compose L with L prime, what do I do? Well, I, um, I notice that I have a two maps over, over V. I have the target map here and the source map here. And what I do is I just form the pullback. So this is a, the pullback. Okay, um, so it's a set of pairs of elements in L and L prime that they, such that they both map to the same spot in V. Okay, and I can, um, since I'm claiming that this is a Lagrangian correspondence from U to W, I need to tell you what the maps are to U and W. Well, to get a map to U, I just compose with a source map of L prime, and to get a map to W, I just compose with a target map of L. And those are my source and target maps. So 
So, so this definition as a pullback square works precisely when these two um, correspondence is con composed congenially, but not, not otherwise. Okay, so now let's get to these, these problems that I spoke of. So the first problem is that this composition is not continuous um, at non-congenial pairs. So, so this diagram here is, 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 will, will give you a continuous composition when, um, when, when you vary through congenial, um, uh, congenial pairs of Lagrangian correspondences. But generally, composition is not continuous. So let's give an example. This is sort of the, the basic example. Um, all other examples are just sort of variants on it. So let's take u to be trivial and v and w to be equal to R2 with a standard symplectic form. So here. Okay. Now I define um, L sub epsilon. So I'm going to define a family of Lagrangian correspondences between um, V and W. So this is going to be consist of the following quadruples of elements. X, epsilon X, so epsilon is my parameter here. Epsilon X comma Y comma um, X comma epsilon Y. So this is a Lagrangian correspondence from, um, from V to W, between V and W. And how am I going to define L prime, which is going to be a, a Lagrangian correspondence from U to V? Well, it's just going to be the x-axis in V. So once again, this is a Lagrangian correspondence between U and V. So remember, U here is trivial, so this is just a Lagrangian subspace of V. OK, so the first thing to notice is that when epsilon is non-zero, this Lagrangian correspondence is just the graph of a map. Okay, so for epsilon not equal to zero, L sub epsilon is just the graph of the map which takes a, a point x comma y and rescales both the coordinates. So it rescales x by x over epsilon and it rescales y by epsilon y. So it's the graph of this map. Okay? And you'll notice that this map preserves the x-axis, right? It just rescales the x-axis. So, so that means that if I compose L sub epsilon with L prime, then for x not equal to 0, I just compose L prime with this map. And L prime is the x-axis, and this map preserves the x-axis. It just rescales it. So I get the x-axis again, now seen as a, a subspace of W. Okay, what about, what about when epsilon is equal to zero? What do I have? Well, <coughs> excuse me. At epsilon equals to zero, L sub epsilon decomposes as a direct sum of two subspaces, the y-axis of W with the x-axis of V. Right? I mean, when epsilon is equal to zero, it's the y-axis, direct sum the x-axis. And of course, the, the x-axis in V I can identify with L prime. Okay, so the first thing to notice is that this will not give me a congenial composition in this case, because these two maps here, the direct sum of these two maps, well, both for L and L prime, the maps to V just give me the x-axis, right? So it doesn't give me all of V. So this is not a congenial composition. And secondly, if I try to compose this relation with this, all I can get is the y-axis. And in fact, that's what I do get. So for x, or sorry, for epsilon equal to zero, epsilon equal to zero, I get the y-axis. Okay, so the point is that this is not continuous at epsilon equals to zero, right? So you see that as I go from epsilon non-zero, along epsilon non-zero, I'm always getting the x-axis, and as soon as I hit epsilon zero, I just jump to the y-axis, right? I mean, that's definitely not continuous. Okay.
Yes, yes. So, so yeah. Yes, yeah. But, um, but yeah, you can already see it even in this example. Yeah, but right. OK. Um, OK, now, now I want to talk about um, quantization. So the second problem is that uh, the linear symplectic category doesn't quantize very, very well. So it's not functorial. So what do I mean by quantization? Well, before I talk about quantization, let's, let's say what, I mean, what, what the target of my quantization is going to be. So it's going to be the Movita category. So um, I'm going to denote that by MOR. And uh, its objects are associative algebras. And its morphisms are, um, so a Morita map between, say, an algebra A and another algebra A prime is not a map of algebras. Instead, um, B is an A prime A bimodule. So it's a, a module on the left for, it's a left A prime module and a right A, A module. And how do we compose these? So composition is given by taking the uh, tensor product. So um, so if I have another one, say B prime, taking A prime, another Morita map to A prime prime, then the composite is defined to be um, the tensor product of B prime with B over A prime. So remember here B prime is a right A prime module and B is a, a left A prime module. So I take that tensor product and of course this still has a residual left um, A prime prime module structure and a residual right a prime, or so A module structure, so it's a Morita map from A to A prime prime. Okay? So that's our composition. Okay, so now I want to talk about vial quantization. So this is, this is the quantization scheme I'm going to look at. So first some notation. Um, so when I write T of V, what I mean, and here V is a vector space, what I mean is the free associative algebra generated by V. So this is the tensor algebra. It can, it's also called the tensor algebra. So it's a graded algebra um, where the grading is over the natural numbers here. And the, 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 the kth graded component is uh, just the k-fold tensor product of V with itself. Okay? Okay, so how do I quantize, so vial quantization? How do I quantize a, uh, a symplectic vector space V? Well, what I do is I map it to the following algebra. So the vial algebra associated to V. So this is defined to be the quotient of the this tensor algebra of V modulo the two-sided ideal generated by the com canonical commutation relations. So what do I mean by that? If I take... Um, a pair of elements x and y in V, and I write the commutator, I take the commutator, that should be equal to um, the value of the symplectic form applied to x and y. Okay? So the commutator of two elements in my vector space just gives me the symplectic form applied to those two elements, so it gives me a number. This is a filtered ideal, and uh, and the result is a filtered algebra. And you can ask what the associated graded algebra is. And that turns out just to be um, isomorphic to the algebra of polynomial functions on V. So that's the sense in which this is a quantization of V. Yeah? Well, well you, you could, yes. But, but I, I mean, they're, they're equal, right? So V and V star are, are canonically equal, or isomorphic, I guess. So this is just simpler to write. But, but I agree, that's probably conceptually the better approach. Okay, um, the, the second thing to notice about, about this is that um, Q of V bar is what? Well, v in, on V bar, I've negated the symplectic form, so I've negated this side, 
which corresponds in this, uh, in this ideal to negating this side of the relation. Uh, but negating a commutator is just the same as interchanging the order of multiplication. So Q of V bar is isomorphic to Q of V, the opposite algebra of Q of V. Okay, now how do I quantize a Lagrangian correspondence? Well, suppose I have a Lagrangian correspondence from, you know, between two symplectic vector spaces, V and W. What do I do? Well, I map this to the following, um, so it has to be a bimodule. I'm, I'm trying to take values in my Morita category, so this, this morphism should be a bimodule for the vial algebras of W and, and V. So what do I do? Well, I define it to be the quotient of the vial algebra associated to, um, to W plus V bar by the left ideal generated by W, or by L, okay? So it's that quotient space. So this is, of course, a left Q of W module, a left module for the, the vial algebra associated to W. But it's also, because I've, I've taken V bar here, it's a right module for the vial algebra associated to V. So this is a Q, W, Q, V, phi module. Okay? So it's, it's a Merida map between the two vial quantizations of the symplectic vector spaces. Okay, and um, you can ask, what's the associated graded module? Um, and it turns out that the associated graded module for this is just the um, algebra of polynomial functions on L. Okay, so that's, so th that's, th that's the quantization of L. Okay, so, so remark. Um, this, this procedure is, is functorial And I'm going to put that in quotes, at, um, boring uh, the terminology from this morning, at congenial compositions. Okay, so that is to say that the quantization of a congenial composition is precisely the, um, the tensor product of the bimodules of the corresponding bimodules, okay? So th this is only if L and L prime compose congenially. Where, where here V is, is the, I'm assuming V here is the, the, the target of, of L prime and the domain of the source of L, okay? Um, but functoriality fails. Let me see what I can erase. Uh, Pardon me? Oh, okay, yeah, so, so yeah, maybe we should take equivalence classes of bimodules. But, um, okay, um, what can I erase? Maybe I can actually erase, uh, erase this here, if you don't mind. So I, I want to keep this, this example up for, for just a moment longer. Okay, so quantization, functoriality fails. At non-congenial Compositions. So let's look at a particular example. Remember here, this 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 family of uh, of Lagrangian correspondences degenerates to a non-congenial composition at epsilon is equal to zero. So what happens if I try to if I try to take the the quantum the composition of the quantizations on the on the side of the Morita category? Well, so let's take the tensor product here of the quantizations of these two particular Lagrangian correspondences. What's the result? Well, when epsilon is non-zero, then, as I said before, f um, the, the, the quantization is functorial. So I'm just going to get the quantization 
of the, of the composition of L of epsilon with L prime. So for And what happens when epsilon goes to zero? Well, this tensor product just becomes zero. And that's a big problem because this composition over here is certainly non-zero. It's the y-axis. It's certainly non-trivial. So it should quantize to something non-trivial. Right? So, so this is a big problem. OK, now the interesting thing, uh, so, so Gaber, so Sternberg and, and, and Gilliman and, um, were looking at this. And then um, Gaber, back in the 80s, Gaber noticed, well, he decided to, to look at this, at this sort of example a little bit more closely. And he, he decided instead of just taking the tensor product here, why not compute the higher Tor groups? So he did that. And he noticed that, um, that all the Tor groups vanish except for a single one. So the first Tor group here was what? Well, it was exactly what one wanted it to be. It was this quantization of the non-congenial composition. So this is, this is Gaber noticed this. So, um, so this suggests that, that we should really be doing something, something derived here, right? We should really be um, taking some derived approach to quantization. Um, and more generally, why not take a derived approach to defining the symplectic category? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that, um, and I'm going to base that, that definition upon the, the paper and the ideas of, of Pantif, Toe, and Vicky, and Vitsozzi, who, give, um, who, who started studying derived symplectic geometry. So this is just this definition of the derived uh, linear symplectic category is just a, a linearization of their definitions. Okay, so it's, it's really just their definition here. So the first thing we want to do when defining a derived version of the symplectic category is we want to replace our, um, our vector spaces by complexes. Okay, so let's do that. So definition. So a symplectic complex is a pair where V is now no longer a vector space, but a, a cochain complex, for example. Let's, let's take cohomological convention. So this will be a cochain complex. And here, I, 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 it's equipped with a two form. So this is an element of wedge two of the dual. But I want it to be, in particular, of degree zero. And I want it to be closed with respect to the cochain differential. And instead of asking this to be non-degenerate on the nose, I weaken that assumption and say that, I, I weaken that requirement and just say that it's a quasi-isomorphism. What does that mean? Well, remember, um, given, given any element like this, I can define this map. And we, this, this element is, is sorry, I, I asked that this map be a quasi-isomorphism. So what do I mean by that? That this map def descends to an isomorphism on the level of homology. So it's not an isomorphism right now, but if I, can, if I take the homology of it instead, I get a quasi-isomorphism. Oh, sorry, I get an isomorphism. OK. So um, what about Lagrangian correspondences? What replacement should we take for those? Well, I'm going to, so what is a Lagrangian correspondence between two symplectic complexes? So Lagrangian correspondence. I'm going to put a little h up here just to, um, just to help us remember that this is not a Lagrangian correspondence in the usual sense. And I'm, I can't really genify, uh, generalize uh, these two axioms. So instead, I'm going to generalize this axiom here, this categorical ax uh, description in terms of this picture. So when working with complexes, it doesn't really make sense so, so I'm going I'm to look at squares like this. But since I'm working with complexes, it doesn't really make sense for me to ask this to commute on the nose. Instead, I'm going to ask it to compute, commute up to a distinguished homotopy. OK? So a homotopy of, of chain comp, uh, co-chain complexes. And it also doesn't make sense for me to ask for this to be a pullback square anymore. Instead, it should be a homotopy pullback square.
Okay? So the definition of a Lagrangian correspondence between two uh, symplectic complexes is precisely a homotopy pullback square of that form. Okay. So how do we how do we define composition of two such Lagrangian correspondences? Well, remember we had this nice um, way of writing out the composition of two Lagrangian correspondences in the, in the underived case when they composed congenially. Or in other words, when this, this map here was a surjection. Now, the beauty of working in uh, derived land um, is that everything, uh, um, everything behaves as though it was in generic position. So we can, just, we can just pretend that everything is transverse. It all behaves, um, all configurations act as though they will be transverse. So it always act as though this condition is satisfied. So we can just define the composition using this diagram for any configuration. We, we, can, we can just drop that, that congenial assumption or that transverse assumption. So, so composition. So if we have two Lagrangian correspondences in, this, in, this, in the sense of this definition, then we define their composition to be the homotopy pullback of the following diagram. Okay? And I'll, I'll put a little h above that circle just to, to, to distinguish this from the usual composition. Okay. So that, that sounds like a, a really nice definition, right? But, um, but why should you believe me that it's a good definition unless I show you that, that this object here is actually satisfies the axioms of a Lagrangian correspondence? So I've, I've described some object here, but how do you know it is a Lagrangian correspondence? Well, the simple answer is that Pantov, Tohn, Vicky, and Vitsozzi proved that. So the simple answer is that there's a proof um, due to them that, that that fact holds. Okay, but what is, but in this particular case, there's a very nice proof. It's very easy to write down. So how do I do that? Well. I draw a little picture. So I take the, the composite. It fits into a pullback square by definition, right? Fits into, sorry, a homotopy pullback square, right? Now, L prime was, of course, a Lagrangian correspondence, so that also fits into a nice pullback square. Right? Similarly, L fits into a, a nice pullback square. A nice homotopy pullback square. And finally, we want to fill something in down here, so we just dualize this square up above. So, this is the dual of a homotopy pullback square. So this down here is a homotopy pushout, while these up here, these three squares, are homotopy pullbacks. Okay? But the nice thing about working with complexes is that a homotopy pullback, or sorry, a homotopy pushout is a homotopy pullback. So it turns out that this will automatically be a homotopy pullback as well. Okay? So then we have these four, four little squares, each of which are homotopy pullbacks. So the big square is then a homotopy pullback too. And that is precisely the definition of a Lagrangian correspondence from U to W. So this shows that we got a Lagrangian correspondence. Okay. So I've defined all these, these concepts, and they fit together for the def to, to give me a category.
Uh, so, sorry, using this definition, do I get a strictly associative composition? Yeah. Okay, so, right, so actually before I, before I write down the, the theorem, so yes, you can, choose, you can choose this composition. I mean, there's very, various choices, but you can choose this composition to make it strictly associative. So that means that you get a semi-category right away. Um, unfortunately, you do, doing that, you, you, you find that you don't have a, a strict notion of unit. So it's just a semi-category. But you do have a nice notion of a weak unit, so something that satisfies the axioms of a unit up to, up to homotopy. Okay? Um, and so uh, using those facts, you can show that this, this is not a category on the nose, but it's an infinity category. So, so symplectic complexes and Lagrangian correspondences form the objects, respectively, one morphisms of an infinity category. Which I'm going to denote by L sim with a little superscript H to say that it's sort of the derived version of the linear symplectic category. And I'm going to call this the derived linear symplectic category. Okay. Okay, so let's compare this with the underived linear symplectic category. So let's compare this derived version versus the underived version. Okay. So the first thing, so suppose we take a symplectic vector space. So in the usual definition. Well, I can always view that as a complex just by as a complex concentrated in degree 0. And so it turns out that you can automatically view that as a, um, as a symplectic complex, okay? Similarly, if I have a Lagrangian correspondence in the usual linear symplectic category, I can view all of these objects as complexes concentrated in degree zero, and it's a quick check to notice that this satisfies the definition of a Lagrangian correspondence in the derived version, right? So for every, every object and morphism in my usual linear symplectic category, I get an off object and morphism in my derived version. Okay, well, what about composition? So suppose I have two Lagrangian correspondences. In the usual sense, which of course I can, and I, I can, using this point here, I can view as Lagrangian correspondence in the dry sense. But suppose, suppose they come from my original linear, the usual linear symplectic category. Well, if they are, if they compose trans, if they compose, if they're a congenial pair. So if they compose transversely, then um, that means that these two maps are surjective, and I can actually, so the sum of these two maps is surjective, and so I can compute this just as the usual pullback. And so I see that um, the derived composite of, of those two is equivalent to the usual composite. Okay? So nothing goes odd if I just have, if I'm just looking at congenial compositions. But what happens in general in general the uh, the uh, drive composite of this uh, um, this drive version of the of the composite um, can be realized as the following complex. So there's a nice formula for it. So I take the direct sum of L and L prime, and I put them in degree 0 of a complex. And now I want to put something in degree 1. 
and I just put v there. And I need a differential, and I take the differential to be the difference of the source and target maps. Okay? So, so there's a, a very simple formula to compute uh, the composites in general. So this is not a, not a bad thing to work with. It's easy to work with. Okay, and uh, just to wrap up the comparison result, um, I should compare this with the uh, Woodward-Verheim category of um, the usual linear symplectic category that Alan talked about this morning. So, so instead of looking at the full um, dry version of the linear symplectic category, let's look at that subcategory which is spanned by the symplectic vector spaces. So I'm going to put a little zero there. So the, the subcategory then there is a there's a functor from this subcategory to um, this category that Alan introduced in the morning. So this category of indexed Lagrangian relations. And this is in some sense, you can see this in some sense as, as the homotopy category corresponding to this. So I mean, sorry, this, oh sorry, I should say, there is a, there exists a full, sorry, I didn't say it quite right. There exists a full and essentially subjective functor between these. Um, so I do lose some information going from here to here in the morphisms, but, but otherwise, um, I, I certainly obtain everything here from this. Okay. So I just have a few more minutes, and I haven't actually shown how D this category solves any of the problems. So I haven't shown how, um, or I haven't talked about how the, uh, composition will be continuous in the uh, derived linear symplectic category or about the quantization um, result. And so unfortunately, I don't have time to prove those results, but let me just explain them. So continuity. So the theorem is that the space of Lagrangian correspondences in the derived symplectic category between uh, linear symplectic category between two symplectic complexes form a nice object so something called an algebraic infinity stack and that might sound like a scary term but really all that means is that there's a nice topology on here and there's a nice set of coordinate charts so I have, I have some nice coordinate charts on here and I have a nice topology Okay, and secondly, composition defines so, um, ah. um, Right, yes, yeah, no, so, sure, so yeah, you can take, you can, you can take V to be zero, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, you need one of them to be, to be arbitrary, yes. You, this is really just the Lagrangian Grassmannian in a single symplectic complex, yes. Um, so, so the question was, can I identify this with And the answer is yes, they should be the same. 
Okay, so composition defines an algebraic map morphism of infinity stacks. between these Grassmannians. Okay, so in particular, um, I mean, these spaces have topology, and, uh, and, and so in particular we get uh, that, um, we get a continuous map, so composition becomes continuous. Okay, so, so, so I mean, composition, it's, a, it's nicer than just cont continuous, but but we see that composition is continuous. Um, and I should say that the, the poof is, is actually fairly straightforward. It's just a matter of really setting up the, the uh, um, setting up the, you know, the, like defining things. Okay. Hey, what about quantization? So unfortunately, I think I've, I've already run out of time, so I'm going to have to just mention this very quickly. But what about quantization? So, well, let me first just introduce the target of the quantization. So we want some, I, we want to take some derived version of the Morita category. So here, it's more with a superscript H. Um, this probably, I, I don't know if this is the official notation of it, but it'll work for the talk. So this is an infinity category with um, objects. They're associative algebras. Or maybe if you are happy with them, you could think of maybe A infinity algebras. Um, and the morphisms are bimodules, as before. Bimodules for these associative algebras, just like in the previous definition. Um, and the, the only thing that's different is that we take the derived tensor product. So the composite of, so if I have B, um, a, a map from say A to A prime, so this is a, a bimodule uh, for, I guess I should do it this way. So this is a, a left A prime uh, module and a, a left A prime prime module and a right A prime module. And I have another one here from another Morita map. So another bimodule between these two. So a right A module and a left A prime module. Then the composite is defined to be uh, the derived tensor product of B prime with B over this middle term A prime here, okay? Um, and so what do, what, what do I mean by that? Well, you can think of this as being some graded module whose great, uh, highest graded component is, computes the Tor group, okay? Right, sorry, so yeah, the, so maybe take everything in a graded sense here, yeah. Yeah, or in an A infinity sense. Yeah, so, so these are complexes of modules. So, so I, I mean, I, yeah, so in fact, in, in terms of just quantizing the usual linear symplectic category, we could uh, take a associative algebras to to really be associative algebras, and then to take complexes of, of modules, at bimodules. Okay. So how do we quantize things? Well, for a symplectic complex, so if V is a symplectic complex, I'm going to quantize it as follows. So I'm gonna put a little H up here to distinguish it from the usual quantization but the usual vial quantization, but it, in fact it has the same formula, the exact same formula for a symplectic complex. I take the free associative algebra generated by that and I mod out by those canonical commutation relations. 
Uh, the only thing that's slightly different is since V is a complex, it has a, it has a differential, and this becomes a graded algebra. In fact, it becomes a DG differential graded algebra, um, which I can see as, say, an A infinity algebra. But, but of course, when V is just a symplectic vector space, this is the usual definition. So not doing anything weird there. And uh, the theorem is that um, this functor extends, sorry, this, this operation extends to a functor from the derived version of the linear symplectic category to um, the derived version of this Morita category. Uh, and um, as I said, this functor satisfies some nice properties. So if V is actually just a symplectic vector space, then this, so, um, so if V is a symplectic vector space, so if it's a usual symplectic vector space, then we just get the usual quantization, vial quantization of V. Okay. Um, secondly, that fact also holds for Lagrangian correspondences. So if L is a usual Lagrangian correspondence, so not in the derived setting, but in the usual setting, then the quantization in this sense of L is just the usual quantization. And what about composition? Well, suppose L prime is a second uh, Lagrangian correspondence in the usual sense, that is. So not in this, not in the derived sense, just in the usual sense, the sense, so, so this is a really just, a, these are symplectic vector spaces, and this is just a, a, a subspace of those two vector spaces, which is Lagrangian, the direct sum of those two vector spaces, which is Lagrangian. Um, then how do we compare the, the, comp the, let's say we quantize L and we quantize L prime. Well, as I said, um, those quantizations are just equivalent to the usual quantizations of L and L prime. And the composite in, the, in this uh, derived Morita category, maybe I should put a little H up there, is, uh, the derived tensor product over the, um, over the quantization, the vial algebra of V, which as it turns out is the derived quantization of the, uh, um, the composite of these viewed as, as derived Lagrangian correspondences. So this, this recovers Gabber's result here. This third property shows that we recover Gabber's result. Okay, and as, as in the case of this um, theorem over here, the proof is once again fairly straightforward. It, it's, it's not too complicated. Um, and it, it's written in, especially when written in terms of Costello and Williams uh, factorization algebra, language of factorization algebras, where, where this, this functor is actually just an example of the factorization envelope. So, so that is to say it's, it's very explicit and has some nice properties. Okay, so, so um, the proof is, is actually, it's, it's, it's really a straightforward application of their theory. Um, so sorry for going over time. Um, I hope that I've convinced you that taking a derived approach to, to um, symplectic and Poisson geometry can be, can be a, a good idea. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for attending my talk.
we, we're using complete SQL spaces a little bit and quasi categories a little bit. And I think maybe there's one place where we, we so at some point you need to transition between Yeah, we, we do use those functions. Yeah, we do use those standard functions to translate between things. So which is which? Pardon me? So which is which? So for the for the um, derived the derived corresponding side. Uh, so 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 actually um, right, so so we want we want to get we want this to be an algebraic stack. Mm -hmm. Right? So so um, it's easy to think of this as some sort of simplicial space, right? So, um, and these are sort of amorphisms in some categories. So, so there, it's nice to think of the category as some bisimplicial space. So here, you would think about this as a complete Siegel space. Um, and once again, yeah, for the Morita, the Dragon Morita category, you, you define it as some sort of complete Siegel space. Um, I mean, it, it, it's actually pretty nice because, as, as I was saying, the uh, um, you can choose that, that composition to be associative on the nodes. So that would mean that direct sum is associative on the nodes. Okay, so so why don't you know that well, you know that detail? Okay. You have to change the objects. Sure, sure. 